is Conrad Steiner. I'm a doctor of medicine. Tonight's story has the title, Red Christmas. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. To the profession of medicine, to the men and women who labor in its cause, this story is dedicated. Our presentation tonight, the field of surgery, more specifically, the field of neurosurgery. The object in point, a piece of red paper. The case in point, Frances Monaghan. Her story concerns a threat to human life about which a medical doctor can do little or nothing. He can only prepare for it and then do his best to repair the damage inflicted. At this hour, in hospitals all over the nation, hundreds of doctors are standing by to meet this particular threat. They know it's coming, but there's little they can do to stop it. This is the story of one of those doctors. Max A. Conrad, M.D., resident physician, neurosurgery, General Hospital. Tonight he's expecting trouble. He won't be disappointed. Wake up, Rosie. Daddy's. From where? Dinner. What's the calorie clinic serving tonight? I had the vegetable plate. Poached egg was very tasty. Your imagination is running riot. There is no such thing as a tasty poached egg. Doctor. How about the boy? Did you get the x-rays on him yet? Mm-hmm. Checked them all over. No fractures of the rib cage. A few contusions, that's all. We sutured the scalp laceration. You okay for discharge? Mm -hmm. Ready to go. Signed out. Doctor. How you doing, son? Uh, I'm doing all right. Where's my ma? I want to go home. Your mother's waiting just outside. You'll be going in a few minutes, Jerry. You said just what the nurse said. It's not right. Oh? What isn't right? You call me the wrong name. My name ain't Jerry. Well, I was just reading your chart. It says your name's Jerome Adams. Yes, sir. That's right. Do people call you Jerry sometimes? No, sir. My name is Jerome. That's the only thing they call me. Just Jerome. Jerry's my brother's name. Well, all right, Jerome. Next time you're out riding your bike, don't try to go through any brick walls, OK? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Here are your clothes, Jerome. Will you let me know when you finish dressing, please? Yes, ma'am. You have ma just listened to the Christmas Overture arranged and conducted by Victor Young. Our next selection will... Wheels, here we go. Never fails, right on schedule. Just about. A little early, if anything. they ever guess they're just what I wanted for Christmas. She'll be all right, won't she, doctor? Take her on up to 5,900, please. Mm-hmm.
to your owners. What happened? Auto versus auto. Out in the freeway about four miles from here. It's just where you turn off to Orange Grove. It was all that other guy's fault. Didn't have his lights on. I didn't even see him. He couldn't have had his lights on. Shock. Get an IV started right away. It was the windshield. She sure must have hit it hard. It wasn't my fault. As soon as I saw the other car, I tried to turn out of his way. Hit the brakes hard as I could. Nobody can say it was my fault. Do you mind waiting outside, please? I'm just trying to tell you what happened, that's all. Never had a wreck in my life. It was the other guy. Miss McKay, would you cut off some of those clothes, please? Plasma ready. Better set up three pints of blood when you're at it. HBD. Some kind of a gin drink. She was strong when we picked him up. The car smelled like a saloon. Face is pretty bad. Leg doesn't help much. 
much either. Better get on an X-ray stretcher. Go to work on that blood pressure. Give us a hand, we fellas. Skull series, chest bone, AP and lateral of the lower leg. Would you get in touch with the attending physician and call for Ward 5000? All right. I think it's Dr. Wilson. All right. Now, at any time since then, did she have a lucid interval? Did she regain consciousness? No, no. You're sure of that? You were with her all the time. She didn't talk. She didn't move. She remained unconscious? That's right. I'm sure of it. How much do you have to drink? Can you tell me that? I don't know. She had one or two, I guess. We had our Christmas party at the office. You know office parties. Girls let down their hair a little bit. Everybody does, just once a year. I guess Frances had a couple drinks. How many? Who knows? Just because she's my secretary, I don't follow her around. She was with Joe Taylor for a while, sales manager. Took her in his office. Probably had a few drinks with him, too. Lousy Joe Taylor. How many drinks would you say she had, all told? She was drinking martinis, I think. Maybe she had four or five. I don't know. Maybe more. OK. Thanks. Uh, wait a minute. Doc, uh, what about Frances? Her, her mother will probably phone me. Uh, what am I going to tell her? I guess you better tell her the truth. Uh, but, uh, Doc, what about my wife? Uh, it's Christmas Eve. Should have been home hours ago. Uh, what am I going to tell her when I get home? I don't know, but you better wipe off the lipstick before you get there. Hey, wait a minute, Doc. It's not what you think. Just a regular office party, that's all. You know, have a few drinks, uh, fool around a little. Christmas party at the office. It's an old custom. That's right. Sure. Some music, uh, dance a little bit, have some drinks, then we all jump in our cars and we all go home for Christmas Eve. All of you? Oh, now, now, wait a minute. You don't think that accident was my fault, do you? It wasn't. They can't say it was. You believe me, don't you? Doc, you believe me? The girl's hurt. She's hurt bad. What I believe doesn't make any difference. Have a seat. the accident. He seemed pretty sure of it. Does she have much liquor? About half a dozen martinis. Better take the pressure. Florence Monaghan there, please. This is General Hospital calling Mrs. Monaghan. Yes, that's right, General Hospital. It's in regard to your daughter, Frances. She's been in an automobile accident and she's here at the hospital now. Hello? Mrs. Monaghan? Oh, yes, she's alive, but her condition is still serious. 
No, I'm sorry. I don't know how it happened. Well, you can come down now if you like. That's right. Fifth floor, Ward 5900. You're welcome. How is it? Coming up a little 60 over 20. Find anything? Yeah. Not much of a Christmas present, is it? Tough break. How about the x-ray equipment? It's on the way. Evening, doctor. Sorry to bother you Christmas Eve and all. No bother. This the patient? Yeah. The condition's pretty much the same as when I talked to you on the phone. Mm-hmm. No doubt in my mind. Loss of vitreous bilaterally. The laceration should be sutured tonight. We can do the nucleation at the same time. All right. Thank you. Sorry for the trouble, but we wanted to make sure. We'll set it up as soon as possible and let you know. Right. Office parties. I wonder how they got started. I wonder when they're going to stop. Just coming up, it was a hundred over sixty about five minutes ago. Sensorium's clear. Good reaction to pain. How'd the x-rays look? Not bad. Transverse fracture of the tibia, middle third. Chest bone doesn't show anything, though. There's no rib fractures. There's nothing in the skull series except a fracture of the frontal sinus, the outer table. Mm. It's lucky. And to get this pressure stabilized, we may be able to pour through this without much trouble. I'd say so. Except for that. Nothing we can do about that. Francis, lie still. Hold your arms still, Francis. Mama, where am I? Where's my mother? Where am I? You're in a hospital, Francis. You've been in an accident. Your mother will be here in a few minutes. Can you understand me? An accident? It hurts. My face. Where's my mother? She'll be here in a few minutes. You lie still now. We're trying to help you, and we can't if you move around. It hurts so much. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Francis, you're not going to die. You're going to be all right. And you just lie still now. <laughs> doctor? Hey, doctor. Would you wait outside, please, Mr. Otis? But I gotta get going. Can't you tell me how she is? I'll be right with you. Well, what about it, Doc? Can't stay here all night. How long are you going to keep me waiting? No one asks you to wait around. You can leave any time you like. Well, I want to be decent about it, that's all. Find out how she is. That's if anybody around here knows. She has some serious injuries, but she seems to be past the critical stage. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> that's a whole lot of nothing, isn't it? I want to find out what's wrong. I think I've been pretty patient about this. I've been waiting here two hours. You've been waiting two hours. Over two hours. You bet I have. Well, what about it? I have a suggestion for you, Mr. Otis. I suggest you wait around a little longer. Wait until the girl's mother gets here. You can listen while I explain the condition her daughter's in. Maybe you'd like to do the explaining yourself. It's your job, not mine. That's right. It's my job. But you might learn something from it. You can hear the kind of questions they ask. You can see the heartbreak and misery in their faces when we give them the answers. 
Believe me, it'd be a lot easier to lie. Tell them a lot of nice, pleasant lies. But you can't. You have to tell them the truth. It's tough, mister. If I could only tell you, it's the toughest thing I've ever done. And it won't be any easier with the girl. Because when the shock clears up, when she begins to realize what's happened, she's going to ask questions. I'd like to have you there, Mr. Otis. I'd like very much to have you there. Because you know what her first question's going to be? You know what she's going to ask? Why is it dark? What do you mean? You said she'd be all right. I said she's out of the critical stage. There's not much doubt that she'll recover. Well, then what are you getting at? Why would she ask if it's dark? Because it is dark, Mr. Otis. She's blind. Both eyes completely macerated. She'll be blind for the rest of her life. What about it, Mr. Otis? Would you like to wait around a while? I'm late. I gotta get home. party at the office, and a young secretary, 22 years old, blonde, and until lately beautiful. The first victim is claimed. The long parade is underway. An expensive parade. Its price, countless millions of dollars. Cars destroyed, property demolished, medical expenses, attorney's fees. But the cost, of course, is only a minor item. So are the man hours lost, potential wealth unproduced. Total's fantastic, but it's only a minor item. Likewise, the time and effort of doctors, nurses, and technicians, who instead of joining the war on disease and contagion, must labor to correct the harm which man inflicts on himself. sudden fear that comes with a phone call in the night, and the long ride to the hospital, the dim corridor, the shadowed room. All these and more, only minor items, compared to this. A human life, the first consideration, the most important. Erase the age, the sex, or the color, and it could be the life of any one of us. In this case, Francis Louise Monaghan, a human life in jeopardy placed there not by the casual mistake of a few, but by the calculated negligence of many. So the annual parade begins, to the hospital, perhaps beyond. And one man keeps asking himself, when will they learn? When will they ever learn? 